and Andrew. Excellent. Thanks, Lisa. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us today uh, for the last seminar. Of, oh, sorry, second last seminar of the spring semester. I hope your last semester is wrapping up well. Uh, if you notice as you joined, we're recording today. Please be mindful and mute your microphone or pause your camera if you're not actively engaged in the conversation. My name is Andrew Bernard, and I'm the director of our centralized course here at UMass Amherst. We've been hosting these seminars to provide awareness for our cores and not just the good work they're doing, but the connections they have with both industry partners uh, and our scientists across campus and beyond. Uh, today, we'll be hearing from Mass Spec uh, and from the team at Broker Deltronics. Del uh, as we're talking about cores and, and other news, the media office recently launched a campaign with a series of articles focusing on core facilities. Uh, there'll be more to come and hopefully you get a chance to check those out. At least we'll put the, the link into the chat. There was a recent article about mass spec, so, so timely to, to hear more about the good work Steve is doing. As I mentioned, the core seminar is being recorded today so that those who aren't able to join can, can check it out later on. So if you have colleagues who aren't able to make it, please make sure you share the link with them. Uh, and there's all of our prior semesters. I think we have three full semesters worth of seminars on those links too. So please take a chance to look, see what's there. We're hoping to host these again in the fall. So if you have ideas of what you'd like to see, please let us know. Uh, we'll also be hosting an in-person event in the fall. So if you have ideas and would like to go showcase some of your science, please uh, keep in mind that we'll be reaching out to you for a call for abstracts. I'll be here monitoring uh, the chat for any questions. So please feel free to post it there, whether it's about mass spec or anything core facility related. Uh, but to get to the good stuff, I'll turn it over to Steve now. Thank you. Um... I don't really have a whole lot other to add to that other than uh, that today's seminar will be about mass spectrometry. So um, it's my pleasure to introduce two guest speakers today from Broker Deltonics, um, who will be talking about um, one of the new instruments um, that is available from Broker. We don't actually have one right now, but we'd love to get one at some point in the future. Um, but they will be talking about um, 4D proteomics and metabolomics. Um, we have Matt Willetts, um, who's the prote Proteomics Applications Manager for Broker, and Erica Forsberg, who is the Metabolomics Market Manager for the Americas. So I will hand it over to them in whichever order they'd like to go. Thanks for being here. Okay, cool. Thank you, Steve. Um, and thanks everybody again um, for, for joining us um, today. So yeah, as Steve said, we're going to sort of um, uh, cover two topics um, today in, in, um, concerning the, the, the Tim's Tough technology, and that is proteomics and, and metabolomics. And for the proteomics part, um, I'm going to actually do a little live demo um, here from our lab in, in Bill Ricker. Um, uh, and then, so I'm, gonna, I'm going to sh give you a bit of a tour of the instrument, um, get a QC sample running, talk a little bit about what's going on, and then I'm going to hand over to, to my, my colleague, um, Erica Forsberg, who's then going to give you some, um, uh, give you an in-depth uh, overview of our metabolomics workflows on the Tim stuff. And then hopefully if we get a chance at the end, we're going to just come quickly back to me and I'm going to be able to show you um, the results of, um, of the QC sample that we ran. So um, I guess we should um, get, get right into it. So hopefully everybody can see, see me in the lab here. Um, I don't know if you're able to make your camera or my, my view a little bit larger if you can't see it already, but I'm just going to stand up here and um, give you a tour of, of what we're actually, what we're looking at here. So as I said, I'm actually here in our, 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 our demo lab in Bill Ricker, Massachusetts. So um, just um, not too far from you guys. And I'm standing in front of one of our Tim's Top Pro 2 systems. Um, so we have two systems in the lab. Um, this one is configured um, primarily for doing proteomics experiments. And, um, and I'll, I'll talk about like that. And I'll also quickly show you the setup of uh, another Tim Stuff Pro 2, which we have set up for uh, metabolomic workflows. So just to give you a quick tour here then. So because um, we're doing proteomics, of course, now we're talking about doing nano chromatography. And so to do that, we have our Bruca Nano Elute. So this is a nano HPLC system. Um, so this is obviously where we're going to introduce um, our sample, either from, from vials or from microtiter plates, wherever you want to introduce your sample. We have the auto sampler, which will obviously pick up the sample, load it onto the sample loop. And then either we can do a trap in a loot where we'd load up the peptides onto a, a trap column and then onto our analytical column, or maybe a direct injection where we load the samples directly onto the analytical column. 
And so we have the nanolute here, as you can see. If I zoom in a little bit more here, you can see that is connected um, via our transfer line here through a column heater where we have our column. So this is a 25 centimeter um, nanoflow column into our captive spray source, which is, our, which is Brooker's nanoflow um, nanospray source, right? So, um, so that's basically the setup that I have here. Um, and a minute, I'm going to actually show you in the software how we'd get a QC running. But, but while I'm here, if I just change the camera view here a second, I can show you just a brief view of the other Tim's Top Pro that we have, Pro 2 we have here in the, in the lab, where in this one is configured for, for, um, for metabolomic workflows. So, so um, and that's configured, as you can see over there, with our Elute um, analytical flow HPLC system um, and, and with our, our, our standard ESI flow source, right? So the two configurations that, are, that we have in the lab, the, the, um, the proteomic setup, and the, and the metabolomic setup you see on the screen at the moment. And moving between the two is really very straightforward. It's simply a matter of just changing the source over. So changing this captive spray source, you see the nanoflow source you see here for our regular ESI source, um, obviously connecting up the HPLC, and then you're basically um, you know, ready, ready to go. Okay, so um, I'm now gonna move over to share my screen. And so hopefully you will then be able to see um, the software itself. Okay, so what you're looking at here then is um, the, the control software. So I'm going to, first of all, um, go to our sample, sample table, right? So in our sample table, this is where we set up our HPLC runs, right? And so you can see we have some feedback from the HPLC system here with some pressures and flow rates. And then down below, you can see we have our sample table, right? So here we're going to tell the system where our sample is located. We're gonna give it a file name. So this is just some human cell lysate, 100 nanograms on column. This is the amount we're going to inject. And then our separation method and our mass spec method. Um, and at the end of this, by the way, we're going to search this data in real time using our own PACER database search engine. So this actually searches data in real time as the data is collected. Um, and so allows you to get the results as soon as the acquisition is complete. Okay, so um, the first thing I'm gonna do then is to, is to take this line and literally I'm just gonna tell the system to run this line, right? So I'm gonna press start sequence. And then what we'll see is that the, um, You'll see we get we get blue lights from the system telling me that the um you know this the in, information and methods have been downloaded to the LC system into the mass spectrometer, and then the system's going to go ahead. We'll see the LC system start to move in a second as it starts to um inject the sample, and we will um, come back to that um, to the to the data as I said um, towards the end of this afternoon. Um, but maybe I can also talk a little bit about the, um, the software as well. So you've just, I've just shown you the, the sample table itself. Um, and, but let's take a look at the, the, the mass spec software itself. And so here you can see, we call this um, uh, Tim's control. And so this is, this is the part that's actually controlling the mass spectrometer. But what I think is um, also useful to show is that you know, a lot of people come to the Tim stuff without, you know, maybe in having an experience of acquiring um, or using this type of instrumentation. And what I think is really nice is to look at some of the built-in application methods that come with the mass spectrometer, right? So we've spent, you know, uh, quite a lot of time optimizing some, some methods that are going to work, you know, really quite well for a whole range of applications. And you can see here, we have, you know, ex ex uh, methods for, for lipidomics, um, both in positive mode and negative mode, in metabolomics, uh, and again, in both modes. And then we also have methods for proteomics, right? So, um, you know, whether it be a, a, a glycan sample or a low sample amount where, you know, where you're living limited on sample, a short gradient, um, a longer gradient or, or other type workflows. So I think that's really one of the nice, nice features of, of, of how we've set up the system is that we include these 
these default methods that, that are really going to get you going and, you know, enable you to acquire, you know, get high quality results um, straight away. Um, just, just on tier. So, okay. So while this is going through the process of um, starting the sample, and we'll come back to that in a second, I'm just going to move to just, just give you a little bit of an overview um, here of some of the results that we can expect to see um, from um, a, a, a proteomics acquisition. So, so one of the neat new features, and I think Eric's gonna, Erica will talk a bit more about the details here in her presentation, but one of the key features about the Tim stuff is we have this ability to do an, a high resolution ion mobility separation um, for all of the ions that, that, that we, we introduce into the mass spectrometer, right? And, and we, we call this ion mobility process TIMS or trapped ion mobility spectrometry. And so the, 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 whole, the whole concept here is that, is that um, we separate ions, as I mentioned, based on their ion mobility or their collisional cross section, right? And the way we, we do that is to trap and elute them in, in, this, in the TIMS analyzer. And this trap and elution process gives us a, not only a high resolution separation of the ions in terms of their collision cross section or their ion mobility, but also gives us a, 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 a quite, a, quite a significant sensitivity boost from the focusing of the ions in the TIMS cell. So we get about a 50 times increase in sensitivity from this. Um, but not only that, because when the ions elute from the TIM cell into the rest of the mass spectrometer, they elute in these very tight packets of ions. Um, this gives us the ability to do um, MSMS very, very quickly. So we can fragment peptides or more than 100 precursors, peptides, metab um, metabolites, whatever we're talking about, more than 100 in a second, right? So we can do very, very fast um, MSMS. And because we can do that, it means we can get very, very deep coverage of whatever sample we're looking at, whether it be proteomics, metabolomics, lipidomics, et cetera. And so we call this four-dimensional, four right? Four-dimensional proteomics, four-dimensional lipidomics. And so you know, wh wh why do we use this terminology? Well, so the, the, the real key is the fact that we, if you think about how we look at the sample, right? So, because we're doing HPLC for every, every peptide or metabolite that we analyze, we know its retention time. We of course know its mass to charge from the mass spectrometer. We have an MSMS spectrum from it, but now we also have that fourth dimension of information, it's collisional cross section, right? And so we are able to use this extra separation and this collisional cross section information to, to aid our identification of, of, the, of the molecules that we're looking at, right? Whether that be um, uh, peptides um, in a database search result, or as Erica will show you, metabolites, et cetera, in, the, in, um, in, in that type of experiment. And so if you, if you look over on the right-hand side of the slide here, what you can see is I've got an, a, a, you know, a, a chromatogram here from a, from a classic complex cell lysate. And I've just taken a, a single um, data point here in the middle of the run and now I've, I'm showing the data in terms of mass to charge on the, on, the, on the X axis and then mobility on the other axis. And so what you can see is all the extra separation that you get from the mobility component, right? So you see all these features that are separated, not just in terms of their mass to charge, but also in terms of their collisional cross section. So you can see you get, you get a lot more information from your sample because of this extra separation that we get in the Tim stuff. And allows us to do a, you know, to, to, to when, we're, when we're fragmenting things to make sure we're only fragmenting that peak of interest because we've, re, we've separated a lot, a lot of the, the co-eluting and background ions away because of this extra dimension of separation, right? And so it enables us to get a lot more information than you, know, you could do on other systems. And so from a proteomics perspective, you know, we can do the classic data dependent analysis, right? For identifying peptides, we call this concept passive. Um, alternatively, we can also do a, a data independent analysis workflow, so so-called DIA passive, um, where we can really take advantage of the speed of the system to get very high numbers of identifications. So I'll touch on that briefly in a second. 
And then also we can do very targeted workflows that we call PRM passive, where again, we can target our analytes, not just based on a specific master charge, but also that, that analyte at a specific CCS value. So just to give you some example of the sort of identifications you can expect from this. So this is some results from a in-house HEK um, cell line digest. So this is a complex human cell lysate. And you can see on the bottom panel here where we've injected 200 nanograms of this, this material on column with a 70 minute gradient. And you can see we're able to you know, very consistently identify over 7,000 protein groups um, from this. Conversely, if you go to a, a much lower amount on column, so 10 times less sample injected on column with just a 30 minute gradient, you can see you know, we're averaging around between you know, 4,000 or 4,500 4, protein groups from, from this. So with a very rapid gradient and just a very small amount of material on column. So you can see you know, the sort of proteome depth we can get from, from this system. From a data independent analysis um, concept. So this is how this, the system dis displays the data, right? So what you'll see is master charge again versus mobility. And you'll see that this set of ions here down below, this is all the peptides, right? These are all the multiple charged species in the sample. Whereas the, the, set, whereas the cloud of ions up here, which are well separated, in terms of their mobility are the singly charged data, so the background data. So if, you, if you're familiar with DIA analysis, right, where we're just selecting small regions and fragmenting everything within that region, if you do this on a non-TIM system, when you, when you isolate and fragment that small region, you're, you're isolating and fragmenting not just the peptides, but also the singly charged background. But when we do DIA on the TIM stuff, we can focus so that we're only isolating and fragmenting just the region of interest. So now, so now we're no longer selecting the, the small molecule background, only the, the multiple charge data. And so we can scan these windows across the mass range, mass mobility range, so that you know, we, can, we can cover all of the peptides of interest and completely ignore the singly charged background. So this gives us you know, a very high degree of specificity and selectivity to the ions of interest. And just to give you a quick overview of what that, those sort of results might look like. So this is some human protein. This is a human cell lysate here, which we've mixed with two different amounts of yeast. So we spiked yeast in at two yeast proteins in at two different concentrations. And you can see we've done this DIA experiment and we're able to quantify over 11,000 proteins from this experiment. And you can see that we get very accurate and, and um, precise quantification of the, the, the different ratios of the, of the, um, the human versus the, um, the yeast protein spiked in. In this experiment, we're quantifying over 8,500 human proteins and nearly 3,000 yeast proteins. But what's really nice is that you can also push this very, very quickly, right? So we saw a little of this before with the HEK cell lysate digest, but here's what happens if you run this sample very quickly. So here's effectively a 44 minute, no, excuse me, that's not true, a, a um, 25 minute gradient where we're identifying over 6,700 protein groups. But if we go as low as a 4.8 minute LC method, so that's acquiring the, all the data in 4.8 minutes, you can see we're still identifying over 5,000 protein groups. So, you know, the, 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 TIMS, the, the way the TIM stuff works enables us to do very, very fast acquisitions and still obtain very high quality data, right? Anybody who's familiar with doing this on another system knows that when you run to go to these very short gradients, you very quickly lose ID rates. And you can see here, we're, we're still maintaining this very high level of identifications. So, this DIA data independent workflow, you know, is a, is a very powerful te technology for, for quantitation of, of samples. And then finally, I mentioned also the ability to do very targeted analysis, right? So in PRM, we're now saying we only want to target specific analytes, right? And so in this case now, so we're targeting based on the retention time of the analyte, the master charge, and of course, also now, the specific mobility, right? So you can see these peptides here eluting 
and we're targeting uh, our acquisition on very specific molecules, right? So the specific master charge of the peptide and a specific CCS value. Um, so this enables you to give, be very selective, right? And so here you can see a classic problem with a PRM experiment where you have this background interference, right? You have these nice extracted ion chromatograms and then this channel with a problem. And if we look at that in detail, we can see that the problem is because of an isobaric interference. But because we can be very selective with the Tim stuff, we can filter only for the ions of interest. And now we get a much more clean um, extracted ion, set of extracted ion chromatograms, right? So we can be very, very much more selective and get a lot more precise data. And so here's an example of some of taking um, some um, spiked peptides into both a, a, both a complex human cell lysate and also a depleted plasma background. And you can see we get you know, quantitation down to about 17 atomoles um, with very good RSDs, you know, 12% uh, or less in, in 30 acquisitions, right? And, and a covering a dynamic range or concentration range of, of 17 atomoles all the way up to 50 femtomoles. So you can see, you know, even, even in these very complex um, backgrounds, we're able to, um, to, to get very, very good quantitative um, results from this. Okay, so that was a bit of a whistle tour stop of just some of the date, the sort of results you can expect in um, our, um, our in data analysis, data acquisition from this. And then I just wanted to jump back before I pass over to Erica here. If I can just stop my presentation from sharing, thank you. Okay, so if we go back now to the um, the acquisition, um, you can see that the the, the time has, has it's injected the sample. And we're now starting to see peptides eluting. And again, you can see the real-time display here, right? So as I showed you before, here's the singly charged background in that in that heat map, and here's the here's the peptides below there, right? So, um, well, what we're going to do is we're going to let this run finish. It's only going to be about 12 minutes of of actual chromatography time. So, um, what I think we'll do now is I'm going to um, hands the, the presentation over to, to Erica, who's going to now give you a, an overview of our metabolomics workflows. So I will stop sharing. Thank you, Matt. And I will start sharing. So moving into the, the other end of the, the mass spectrum, um, looking at more of the small molecule world, which is where um, my field of expertise is based. I'm actually, I'm based in San Diego, California. So I'm coming to you from the other side of the country today. Uh, we do have a, a demo lab in our uh, in San Jose that I, I frequently visit as well, um, but we do the same kind of experiments that Matt's doing um, in Bill Ricca over in San Jose. And I just wanted to take you through some of our metabolomics workflows. And of course, if there's a lot of focus on proteomics, we always like to focus on the, the metabolomics side because we, we tend to, to talk about metabolomics being closer to our expressing phenotype. And this helps us complete a picture when we're doing any kind of biological study. Um, when we look at the different modes of metabolomics that we can run, uh, we can run with targeted metabolomics. Uh, however, when you're doing more of a discovery type of analysis, this does tend to bias you to only a few different analytes within your system. And this is why we really like to broaden what our experiments look like by running untargeted workflows so we can get more metabolome coverage and increase the, the number of metabolic pathways that we can cover and get some kind of idea of how things are changing in say a disease state or some kind of immune deficiency or any other kind of comparative analysis within our, our experimental design. So, what I really wanted to focus on is how PASF can really help with separating small molecule metabolites. We saw this from a uh, proteomic standpoint where we, we see our analytes coming into the TIM cell and we actually have two TIM cells. And the, the key to this is that we can in parallel while we're looking at one set of uh, analytes be moving the other ones in for their mobi mobility separation. And let me just see if I can get my laser pointer up here. 
or I don't know if people can actually see my cursor because that might just be sufficient as well um, in the essence of time here. So this is our, our first Tim cell uh, here and our, our second Tim cell here. And what happens is that once we start accumulating in one cell, we can move on to the, the next one uh, to it, accumulate more ions. And this allows us to have a 100% duty cycle and allows us to also get that speed when we have to actually undergo fragmentation. And all of these are aligned. So the, the algorithms work such that we can align all of our fragments with our, uh, with our MS values. And what this ends up looking like in a metabolomics experiment is a huge amount of species that we have both fragmented to give us MSMS, MSMS data, as well as giving us mobility data to give us that CCS value or collisional cross-sectional value that is gonna help us with our annotation workflow. And anyone that's familiar with metabolomics experiments will know that the chemical diversity that's in small molecules is significantly greater than the 20 amino acids that's present in a uh, proteomics experiment, which causes issues when it comes to figuring out what is actually going on in your sample. Um, so when we run with a TIMS on experiment where we have that mobility offset and mass aligned separation, we end up seeing a significant increase in the number of MSMS spectra that we can actually collect data for. And this is gonna give us so much richer information that we can now get a bigger picture of what's going on in our overall metabolome. And it is the same with a proteomics experiment where you have really fast acquisition speeds. So we can get over a hundred Hertz of MSMS data acquisition, and we get a significant number of those that have uh, high quality MSMS data. Uh, one thing about CCS values, we are starting to use these in our actual annotation workflows. So we're not just looking at this on a, um, we can use it as a filter to be able to separate and get cleaner MSMS, but we can also use this as a, a way to pinpoint what that metabolite actually is. And this is actually a comparison study that we did with some of our um, Timstoff Pro instruments, one in Bremen, Germany, where our R&D lab is, and one at the Australian National Phenome Center that's run by Jeremy Nicholson. And we did a comparison of the CCS values that we could collect for various metabolites. And we always see this less than 1% deviation between our instruments, which shows us that this is a highly reproducible way to collect a CCS value that we can use in our annotation workflows. Uh, not only are we comparable to our own instruments, but we're also compared, comparable to uh, drift tube instruments. So we've done comparisons with uh, the CCS compendium, which is developed in John McLean's lab at Vanderbilt University. And he has one of the most comprehensive experimental CCS libraries. And the technology of drift tubes are kind of opposite to what Tim's technology is, where the um, in our systems, the gas goes in, in one direction in an electric field and the other in a drift tube, it's, it's reversed. So the physics behind it is equivalent. So we can still calculate confident CCS values that are within 1% of what is published in the uh, CCS compendium. Uh, in addition to this, we've also utilized uh, machine learning models and been able to develop predictive models so we can predict based on a chemical structure what that CCS value is going to be. And that way we can compare our experimental data to what is in um, a, a predictive library to help us with our annotation for compounds that might not be present in that uh, CCS compendium or whatever other experimental databases are out there. Because even though this is a, a powerful tool, having that curated data in the experimental databases is still coming along. So we utilize CCS prediction quite a bit in both our lipidomics and metabolomics workflows. Uh, one thing I, I also wanted to know was that we can really hone in and highlight the differences, small structural differences within small molecules. So there are some instances, and not all enantiomers will do this, but we have some examples of where we can really 
push the limits of the TIM cell and highlight the separation of uh, chiral compounds. And this is an example, uh, this was actually an ASMS poster last year and is um, going to be uh, published as an application note from Bruker coming up shortly. And we've highlighted the uh, ion mobility differences between thalidomide, verapamil, and oxazepam. So uh, when you're doing any kind of drug study or um, looking at any kind of ADME or tox kind of study, then there is a high possibility that you can separate your drug drug of interest or its metabolites from your, uh, from your overall metabolome that you're looking at. Uh, so in addition to that, once you actually have those, especially when you're doing any kind of um, biological study, especially with a, a pharmaceutical or drug, we want to make sure that we can actually quantify this. And because of that ability to give us ion mobility separation, we can actually get quantitative data that you could do on a, say, a triple quad. And this is an example of paratifin that's been spiked into urine. And we can see that there's an extremely high dynamic range. So we can get a nice looking calibration curve so we can do quantitative analysis. And even at the, the low end versus the high end, we can get equivalent MSMS data. And the power of this is uh, not only for um, the ability to match with databases, but it highlights the ability of that low level not being interfered with anything that's in the background of your LC. So we get clean separation. And just to give you an example from this specific experiment, we had a uh, contaminant that was within the LC system on this mass particular LCMS that had at the lower levels a very significant isotopologue of that contaminant that was within 100 millidaltons of our actual analyte of interest. And if you didn't have the ability to separate in ion mobility, you would have them co-elute and you would get this chimeric spectrum that would convolute what your data analysis would look like. So you'd have some hesitancy about whether or not that was actually a, a true analyte of interest. Uh, so when you have ion mobility on, we see good separation between our contaminant and proatifin, which you can then be used to confidently annotate what that compound is. Uh, something else that we use from the, the triple quad world is a new ionization source that has been optimized for the TIMS Top Pro, specifically for uh, lipidomics and metabolomics type experiments. This is called our VIP HESI. This is a vacuum insulated probe and heated electrospray ionization source. This is actually gives us about five times greater sensitivity than our original ionization source. And this helps with, again, those small molecules, small are low abundance metabolites. And one of the benefits of this uh, source is that because it has that vacuum insulated probe, it really helps with keeping those analytes stable so they don't uh, undergo as much in-source fragmentation. And that's what helps boost that sensitivity. So I'll touch a bit on how we do our data analysis, because as you can imagine, when you get tens of thousands of features, we have to go through not only our data acquisition, but some way to do feature detection, identification and annotation, and then statistical analysis. So this is a, a software tool called Metabascape, and we use this with all of our different uh, mass spec platforms. And it's a way to organize your experimental design and then uh, highlight what the features are, doing annotation and then statistical analysis. And it a, a, has a lot of other tools within it to help you with your data analysis on a system, uh, systems wide. And uh, one of the main parts that we have here is called uh, our T-Rex algorithm. This is our 4D uh, algorithm that allows us to do feature extraction within the, that fourth dimension, including uh, mobility. So how it works is we, we do a first pass over all of our M to Z features. And there's typically a threshold that's set for what's a feature and what is noise. In some cases, say you have a, a wild type versus knockout experiment, some of those features might be lower down below our threshold and in the noise. And what this algorithm does is it will go back and look at that same M to Z value and see if it's hidden within the noise. And this is going to allow you to pull that out as a feature so you can still do confident statistical analysis after your um, features are pulled out. 
uh, not only do we have that uh, ability to do feature extraction, but each one of these is going to give you uh, a look at what all of the different adducts are. So you can see that we have uh, a neutral loss of water, your M plus H, your M plus sodium, M plus potassium. And each one of these um, adducts is going to have a CCS value associated with it. And not only do we collect those CCS values, but we can do internal calibration within each one of these samples. Um, uh, we typically have a calibrant injected with every single sample. So we can uh, get that sub PPM mass accuracy and that less than 1% deviation in our CCS values. Uh, so when we look at annotation, we, we say 4D. Um, in metabolomics, we, we really like to talk about 5D. Uh, we, we have not only our M to Z value, but we utilize isotope patterns as well to be able to identify what our chemical for formula is accurately. And then on top of that, we also look at our retention times, our MSMS data, and our CCS values. And that all goes together within a, a scoring algorithm to tell us what is going to be a, a confident feature or maybe a not so confident feature. These are all uh, optimizable and you know, these parameters can be changed. So you can set that threshold so you can say what's a good feature and what's not depending on your instrument and how it's behaving that day and um, anything else that might be going on within your lab. Uh, statistical analysis. Metabolscape can employ both multivariate and univariate statistics. So we can uh, use many different types of PCA plots with different types of scaling and allowing us to see to pinpoint what is really changing within our um, entire experiment between different sample cohorts. And then we can also hone in and look at the actual um, univariate statistics and, and look at box and whisker plots and um, volcano plots, et cetera. Oh, that's more multivariate. But yeah, we have a, a slew of statistical analysis that you can perform to really highlight what is changing between your different samples. And that's not only done on the uh, MS1, or an, uh, but also in the mobility region as well. Uh, so when we're looking at MSMS data, we actually have integrated multiple different uh, MSMS spectral libraries that we can use for comparison. Uh, we have the Metabobase personal library, which contains over 100,000 compounds. Uh, this one's near and dear to my heart because I, I worked for Gary Shusdak in uh, uh, the Scripps Research Institute for my postdoc. So I'm very familiar with the Metlin library. And, and um, this is a very comprehensive library of many different types of compounds. So not just looking at your endogenous metabolites, but a lot of drug compounds and toxins as well. We also have really honed in libraries like the Human Metabolome Database Library. Uh, which has over 6,000 MSMS spectra in it, as well as we have access to the NIST 2020 mass spec library, which has over 30,000 compounds. So those are all high res data that we can use for comparison with our, um, our uh, biological systems. And in addition to that, we've been working with Lloyd Sumner's group at the University of Missouri, and he's been developing a plant-based library as many secondary metabolites and natural products can be very useful in, in a lot of uh, drug target and, and development studies. Uh, one more little tout for our CCS Predict Pro. Uh, we've been working uh, with mostly lipids originally to try and, and develop training sets to get uh, predictive algorithms out there for doing uh, analysis of lipids. But now we have that also available for our small molecules as well. And this is all integrated right within Metabascape, so you can do that predictive analysis if you don't have an experimental data point to compare to. So what if you don't have uh, an MSMS spectrum to compare to in a database? What if the, you're just basing your an annotation on a CCS value that's predicted? Well, we do have some tools as well to do compound identification. And those of you who have done any metabolomics experiments know that uh, annotation of unknown metabolites is one of the, the roadblocks in doing a full comprehensive metabolomics experiment. So we have integrated smart formula, compound crawler, and metfrag as a workflow to help with compound identification of true unknowns. So smart formula is uh, 
based on the seven golden rules that was developed in uh, Dr. Oliver Fiend's lab at UC Davis. And this allows us to use not only MS and that isotope pattern, but the MSMS data to help us with determining what the, the molecular formula is. And again, these, this is something that can kind of, the parameters can be tweaked to your particular experiment. So if you're looking for something in particular that you can make sure that you include elements of interest. Um, and then that, ends up turning up an entire list of molecular formulas. Now, obviously there's some ambiguity there. You're gonna to wanna to figure out what potential compounds are related to those molecular formulas. So this is where compound crawler comes in. This allows us to hook up our potential molecular formulas with various uh, structures. And that will allow us to get a list of uh, compounds that are putatively identified. And then we can go through and, and compare with our MSMS data. So we can access ChemSpider, Chebby, and PubChem. And although these are not our own products, we do have an interface that will allow us to ping those databases directly online. Now, this also links directly to the website. So if it comes up with a hit that matches your molecular formula, you can go in there and actually take a look at it and see if it makes sense with your, with your data. And then once we get our putative matches, then we can actually go in and look at in silico fragmentation of your proposed structures. So you can determine whether or not your experimental MSMS spectrum makes sense with the fragmentation pattern that's predicted. In addition to this, we also have a, a module called Biotransformer, and this is to annotate um, metabolic products. So you can uh, input multiple different enzymatic processes and transformations to predict what the biotransformation product would be. And then this is all integrated back into that whole compound crawler workflow. So you can identify the um, putative metabolites and whether or not that matches with the predicted MSMS spectrum. And not only do we do MSMS in there, but we can put in that additional fourth dimension of CCS and have that predictive value there. So you can get a good idea of what it is. And then maybe, maybe it's at a point where you have, you're relatively confident as to what that compound is. So you could get an analytical standard so you could compare with your, with your real data. Now, finally, you want to actually know what the biological relevance of all of your features are. So once they're annotated and you have a good idea of what your uh, changes are occurring, we can uh, map this back onto metabolic pathways. So we do have integrated pathway mapping where we can pull in metabolic pathway maps from wiki pathways or keg pathways and be able to map the changes occurring within our system on those metabolic pathways. Now I've talked a lot about small molecules, but we also do a really good job at separating lipids. So we can actually do a pretty comprehensive separation on um, structural changes that can be pretty minor. So positions of double bonds, we can detect in ion mobility. So this is an example of two isomeric phospholipids that have been separated in the mobility range, which would have co-eluted within a, a regular LC run. And this is just a, an example of how well that separates within the mobility region. Of course, this is a, a PE versus a PC, but those do give you very different MSMS spectra. And this highlights the ability to uh, separate in that ion mobility region while selecting our mass of interest for fragmentation to give us two very clean and very different MSMS fragmentation patterns that was going to allow us to annotate it and identify what it is. And not only can we do this in our standard workflows, but we can cut this down to five minute runs where we can still obtain over 75% of unique lipid annotations. So this allows you to run your experiments faster and get more data because who doesn't love more data? <laughs> And um, we can do dereplication of our lipids for identification. So we end up plotting these on our uh, overall chromatogram uh, versus M to Z, which can pick out what the different classes of lipids are. And we do this by assessing uh, in both the mobility and mass region. And we can highlight the number of increasing double bonds. They usually end up uh, coming in a, a nice diagonal line there that's uh, based on the number of uh, double bonds versus the increasing chain length. And this is, is then 
plotted in our Kendrick mass defect plots. And these are very useful for determining different lipid classes and then honing in on those analytes of interest that are uh, within the, it, the lipid space. So you can see that they tend to cluster together. So we can see our LPCs and TGs are, are separated out in, in one unique portion of our uh, KMD plots. Uh, one other thing that the KMD plot plots allow us to do is to determine outliers, and that's something that actually happens in our annotation. We do have lipid annotation tools that are based on the uh, their rule based annotations, so they're based on the lipid standards initiatives that are uh, ongoing and always um, improving that allow us to determine based on the chemical formula and the M to Z value and isotope pattern, et cetera, of, of what that analyte should be. But sometimes in both the retention time and in the CCS dimension, the, they're misannotated. And this is a tool that we have to be able to identify any outliers that don't fall into that uh, particular plot. So th these are very useful tools that we have for being confident about our annotations. And with that, I think we're just about at, at time and I wanted to give Matt a few more minutes to go through some of the QC data with you. So I'm gonna stop there and pass it over to Matt and I'm hoping that we'll have time for a few questions when we're done here as well. So um, a couple of acknowledgements to our um, collaborators that helped with developing some of this data. And um, I will pass it back to Matt. Thank you all for your attention. Awesome. Thank you, Erica. So I'm just going to see my screen now, hopefully. And yes, OK, cool. Yeah, so um, while we were looking at metabolomics, the, uh, the, the short 12 minute gradient of the complex cell lysate finished the acquisition. Um, if I pull up the sample table now, we can see, you know, obviously very quick. So, so you know, peptides started looting after about four minutes. They looted very quickly from the column and then came down at the end. And so, yeah, so as I mentioned, so one of the things that we did here was, as obviously apart from acquiring the data was to have this um, searched automatically by our PACER database search engine. So this is literally taking each MSMS spectrum as it's acquired and, um, and, and searching against the database so that by the time the acquisition is complete, your database search results are complete. And so to do that, so PACER is just a separate computer which sits next to the instrument computer and it works on a, a web-based interface. So here you can see here's the software, it's project-based. So here's all the projects we have on this particular PACER computer. And here's our live lab demonstration the project I set up down here. And if I go to view here, then we can see the results of that, that very quick QC 100 nanogram load. And so you can see from just that 12 minute gradient, we're able to identify, PACER's identifying um, nearly 3000 protein groups and about 17 and a half thousand um, uh, peptides. So I hope that gives you some idea about just how fast you know, you can run the Tim stuff and still still obtain very high numbers of protein identifications from just 100 nanograms um, injected. So um, I can obviously dig deeper into this now. So if I if I click on the result now and go to result view, then it's going to show me a list of you know all the peptide or the proteins, excuse me, identified, you know, which we can download these results for further you know um, interrogation. Um, so here you can see, obviously, the, you know, the appropriate information for the accession number, protein name, um, some scoring, et cetera, how many peptides matching. You can see if the, this, this, this protein here, we're seeing 80, 85 peptides matching this protein. So it's probably a pretty big protein. And if we click on the view button here, it'll take me to um, the view. So you can, yeah, so this is a very large protein. You can see the protein sequence here from the database where you have the matching coverage in yellow here. And you can see we're matching about 25% of the sequence coverage of this protein um, and in amongst all the other proteins. And if I scroll down here, you can see, we can see all the matching peptides to this protein, right? And if I go to spectrum view here, then it will show me that each one of those peptides, the resulting MSMS spectrum, along with the annotation of the B and Y ions for, for, that, for that particular peptide. Yep, so I can click back and click another one here. And again, you can see nice annotation here 
of the of the sequence um, for for for, the, for these particular peptides. So you can see, you know, you see all, all the typical things you expect to see from a database search engine. But the real key point here is that you know we get these results in real time, so we don't have to wait for the data to finish, move the result, move the data to a different search engine, start the search, you know, and have to wait anything from 20 minutes to several hours to come back for the results. Right? We get those results straight away. Um, and so one of the things that um, I we, we can also do, so this is obviously, this is searching DDA data, so that's what we ran today, but we can also use this to search DIA data. So um, we can do that data independent analysis workflow um, on here, and um, we can see, um, here's another example data set here now. So this is again, some results here from a DIA data set so again, here you can see we're doing 100 nanograms of our human K562 cell lysate. And because we're doing DIA now with the slightly longer gradient, you can see now, this I think is a 30 minute gradient. You can see in this case now, we're able to identify you know, over 6,600 protein groups and over 70,000 peptides. So you can sort of see what, you know, what, what, what DIA analysis on the, on the TIM stuff for proteomics can, can do and the sort of data you can you can achieve from this. And again, this is happening, you know, basically in real time, right? So um, shortly after the run is finished, you can see your, your results and, you know, and get into the data analysis part of it, rather than having to wait for the database search to be completed. Okay, so that was pretty much what I wanted to show you, just a, just a, a real time setup of a sample and, you know, how, the sort of results you can expect to see um, from this. So um, I guess now it's probably a good chance to open it up for questions. That's a lot of information. <laughs> um, I have one question actually, which is um, actually two questions. So your DIA workflows, um, are they, do you use libraries for those? Uh, you can use either. Yeah. So we typically use either Spectronaut or DIANN. In fact, it's DIANN, which actually we incorporate into our Pacer search engine. Um, so that's what's running in real time. So both these software support library based or library free. You'll get more depth of coverage with the library, but even, even modern library free workflows are pretty, pretty, you can get pretty good depth. Great. Um, the other question I have was, was more about uh, quantitative proteomics. Um, are you more in favor of doing label-free stuff, or do you have workflows in place for doing um, sort of TMT type? So, yeah, I mean, you can do TMT on the TIM stuff. Um, what I would say, though, is that we don't have the resolution at the low end to be able to do, you know, like all of the 16 plex, right? So you could take nine of those 16 plex and, and run those on, on, the, um, on the TIM stuff, and we have built-in methods to do that, it works really, really nicely. In fact, because you have this extra separation, you get that cleaner MSMS spectra, so you get less compression, right? Um, and then of course, label-free workflows work really nicely, particularly with the DIA approach. So we have lots of people that have moved from a TMT-based process to a, to a DIA library-free because of the speed, right? Yeah, very cool, thanks. Lijun has a question. Yes, uh, thank you so much. There are a lot of information. Um, I think I'm very naive in proteomics. I go to Steve asking questions all the time, but still, I think the terms you guys exchange, it does not explain details with me. But my system working on a micro host interactions. So the proteins I'm interested in could present in the system with very small fraction. Mm -hmm. So I think with this model, because your input is a very small amount of protein you need it. So we'll be able to detect the like um, lower abundant proteins? Um, very likely, yeah. So because the sensitivity is, is so good on the Tim Stuff Pro, as you, as you mentioned, we, load, we, need to, we, can, we can load less and still get very high numbers of IDs. And because it's so fast, 
we can identify more peptides, which enables you to dig further down into the into the proteins there. So I would say there's a good chance, but you know, without testing it, of course, I can't say for sure. But yeah, mm -hmm. that's sort of so that's the sort of sample where the Tim Stoff would typically do very well. Okay, I like you say testing samples. So, uh, so if well, so when when we want to do a comprehensive study, you're going to have. I did a quick number, it quickly go to hundreds, right? So you're going to be very expensive, I assume. Um, so first, first of all, I will have estimate if I want to run a sample, what's the cost it will be? And it will be, it has some good testing sample to test it out and maybe convince the funding agents to go for it. Mm -hmm. So, okay, so we typically don't do a fee for service um here at brooker um so we uh, you know the, the demo lab is really set up for people to evaluate instrumentation you know when they're when they're thinking about purchasing a new system oh so, okay so this is yeah. steep to talk to huh so if it's yeah. steep, a good instrument that i see so but obviously if you know if you if you if you and colleagues will be interested in potentially you know uh, having a tim stuff in your in your in your facility at some point and you wanted to evaluate then that would be, you know, potentially good, you know, samples to think about talking about to run here, you know, in the lab to, to give you an appreciation of the sort of results you can achieve. So, which means uh, before I write a support letter to Steve, I would like to see whether the feasibility to use it on my sample. So you are okay if we drive to Boston, bring a few samples to give it a run? Yeah, if you're interested in evaluating, that's something that we we can definitely set up. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Um, so just to give the audience a sticker shock, how much do these guys cost? It's probably more of a question for Vic because I noticed he's on the line too. But if you were to buy a Tim's Tough Pro with an LC system and all the software that was associated to do this kind of work, what what sort of ticket are we looking at? Yeah, so I think if we're in the proteomic space, um, where you have a nano LC as well as the um, the instrumentation itself, um, you'd probably be in the say seven fifty to eight fifty kind of range in terms of the the money. It depends on on exactly how these things are configured, right? So it's it's um, you know not as high as some of the sort of ultra high resolution uh, orbital instruments, but it's also not. You know, uh, it's, it's a little bit more than a regular QTOF would be, um, you know, in terms of getting that kind of capability, right? And so I think it's quite achievable with some of the grant mechanisms, you know, whether you do a SIG or, or an HEI or something like that, or some other mechanism with the NSF. You know, we can get there, you might need some matching funds or buy the LC and just get the mass withdrawal, but there'll be a way to get there. Sure. So it's good to know the uh, the rough number we're talking about. So we're sure. Not <laughs> waving around in the dark. Yeah. But um, I, I think the key thing is to think about what you want to do analytically. Do you have enough support on campus to get, you know, several PIs together to, to want to go after such a, a, a proposal? And, you know, then we'll work with you on a configuration that makes sense all around. You can imagine for metabolomics, obviously the front end's different. Um, we're talking about conventional flow HPLC then and our probably VIP heated electric spray as he saw us, uh, instead of the Nanoflow setup, right? And so that's a little bit different cost, not, not so far away, it's probably a little bit lower. And then we have different analytical tools on the back end software wise to complete the package. Um, our Metabascape that you've seen, uh, you know, in detail here with Erica and then on the proteomic side, our Pacer or other, other workflows that you, you may want to deal with for the proteomics data. So. Sure. There's open source tools as well, by the way. So I mean, you don't have to always have our stuff, but um, certainly at least you can have a complete solution. With it. And there is a Tim's Tough with a moldy source, is that right? That's correct, yes. So we have um, a, a dual, dual source instrument. And the beauty is that the sources are permanently installed. They coexist. And it's a click of a button in the software that changes you from electrospray or LC mode over to Maldi mode. And so you can imagine, I think last year we did a presentation for the core and talked about Maldi imaging, tissue imaging. Um, you can imagine doing that on a Timstar flex type instrument 
and then perhaps doing laser capture micro dissection and taking a small section of the tissue and then doing deep proteomics or something like that on those on those few cells or something like that sort of localized area of interest that's a workflow we support within the within the tim stuff flex instrument that product is a little bit more money that's in the million to million two range because obviously we've got all the molding and the imaging all the other stuff built onto it but still well within an hei type proposal yep cool very exciting um I don't know if there are any other questions. Well, well, you've got Erica, if you've got metabolomics questions or, or proteomics for Matt, I would encourage you, don't be shy, ask, ask away. <laughs> I think one of the problems is we've ended up in finals week. Oh, jeez. <laughs> so a lot of our grad students are actually proctoring exams today, but ah. that's the beauty of uh, recording this is that people can watch it offline afterwards. So. Yeah, for sure. And I Perfect. hope that we, we, you have all of our contact information. So if there are any further questions, don't hesitate to reach out. Absolutely. Perfect. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Erica. Thank you, Steve, for, for organizing and hosting. Um, thanks all for joining in. Uh, our next seminar is going to be the last of the semester, uh, next Tuesday, May 17th, same time, same place. And we'll be showcasing the Animal Models Core facility. So we hope you all will join us then. Thanks again. Cool. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.